So this is the question you need to answer in five minutes. Well, the number is the same in all carriers, whether you are using Turkcell or Avea. So here comes the answers. Yes, just send an SMS message with A or B. So A and B are equal, almost. A started to win. So here we have a, a card whose speed is constant. So is it possible for its velocity to be changing? So B is catching up. So what do you think? A varying velocity with constant speed. So A started to win. So there are no more bees around. So check with your neighbor. If your neighbor has a different answer from you, just discuss with your neighbor. So if your neighbor has the same answer with you, find somebody who has a different answer. Anybody who is planning to answer but who didn't answer yet? Sure. So is it possible to have a changing velocity when your speed is constant? Uh, that I don't know how to explain it uh, more simply, <laughs> because if you translate it into Turkish, it doesn't really make that much sense. <laughs> because in Turkish, velocity and speed are the same thing. We have the same word for that. 
But remember, the difference, what is the difference between velocity and speed? You tell me. Hmm? Well, velocity is a vector. Speed is a scalar. If you remember, vectors have two, inf two properties. They have a length, a number, which we call the speed, and also a direction. So a changing vector can be a change in any one of these. It can be the speed can be changing, or the direction can be changing. If speed is constant, there is still the possibility for a direction change. So the answer to this one, a car can have a changing velocity, even if its speed is constant. The answer is A. So who thinks it doesn't make sense? Just don't, don't change your idea just because I, saw, I told you that the answer is A. I might be telling you something stupid. So is there anybody who thinks the answer is B? So I'm so convincing. So let's see. So let's go back to the lecture. I have other questions after we do some more stuff. So this we had already done. Well, this is kind of considered to be one of the most difficult kind of problems in mechanics. So this time it's again a projectile motion, but this time we have a hill. So you are hitting a wall uphill. Now the question is, well, before we found the range when it was just a uh, flat ground. Now we have the hill. So what is the range in this case? How far away from the origin, from the bottom of the hill does the ball hit? So that's our question. So before using all the formulas we have, all the machinery we have, we, we first have to decide how are we planning to attack this problem? What, what are we going to do with this problem? Now, in the previous problem, for example, the fact that the, when we were defining the range, we said that, okay, the range is uh, the distance along the x such that the z is zero. So if you set z equal to zero, that is the ground. On the ground, you have two points that the trajectory hits, the first point, the initial point, and the next point that it hits, the second point. So those two points, the distance between those two points give us the range. Well, the same thing here. I have the, this is a parabola. Well, if there were no hill, the, my, my object would just continue the par parabola and hit it here. Now, the range is smaller than that one because there's the hill which blocks the motion. Now, this point is both on the parabola and also on this line. So that is the thing we will be using. We'll, we will be finding the trajectory. First, we should find the trajectory which is kind of independent of the existence of the hill. The trajectory will be this parabola. And then we should find the points on the trajectory which are also along this line. That is what we will do. First, forget about the hill, solve for the trajectory. And once we know the trajectory, find the points, for find the points on the trajectory that are on this uh, line. And we should get two, two points, this point and this point, the diff distance between those two points is, will be our range. Of course, first we have to build a mathematical representation of this problem. For that, we have to first choose a coordinate axis. So let's just choose. Let me just choose my coordinate axis like this. Again, I repeat, the coordinate axis you can choose Whichever way you like, it is up to you. I could have chosen a coordinate axis for which the x-axis is along the horizontal and the y-axis is along the vertical. Such a coordinate axis would have the advantage that the gravity will only have a y component. The, the gravitational acceleration would have uh, only a y component. 
but then this point here will ha would have uh, non-trivial x0 and y0 components. If I choose such a coordinate axis, it had the disadvantage that the gravitational acceleration, well, it is pointing this way. So it has both the x component and the y component in this coordinate system. So it will kind of complicate my problem. But then the equation for this line is kind of trivial. Any point on this line has the y component 0. Well, I'm assuming that this origin is in fact here. But just for clarity, I just displayed it over here. This point is in fact here. This is my x-axis, and this is my y-axis. So any point on my line has y equal to 0. In that sense, it is quite similar to my previous problem, because in also in the previous problem, I said that the ground was z equal to 0. In this case, it is y equal to 0. Well, in this coordinate axis, we should write down our vectors in terms of their components. It kind of looks a bit complicated, but OK, this is my vector v0. The angle it, wa it makes with the x-axis, <coughs> remember, the, my vector makes an angle theta with the horizontal axis. And the slope of my hill is alpha. So my vector makes an angle theta minus alpha with the chosen with my x-axis. So that is the angle it makes. Well, the component along the x-axis is v0x. The component along the y-axis is v0y. v0x is nothing but the length of my vector, v0, times cosine of this angle, cosine theta minus alpha. It is along the x-direction. Then I have v0y along the y-direction. v0y is the hypotenuse times sine of this angle to find the length here. It is v0 sine theta minus alpha along the y hat. I also need to do the same thing for my acceleration. I know that my acceleration is pointing downwards. I just shifted a bit so that it will be more clear. From this point, it is a vector pointing downward with a uh, magnitude g. So the, this, the length of this vector is g. Well, this angle over here is the angle alpha. If alpha was 0, then the acceleration would be completely along the y direction. So if you look at here, it has the y component. The y component is this vector over here. Its length is g, the hypotenuse, times cosine this angle. OK, this length is g cosine alpha. Of course, it is pointing downwards, or it's pointing in this direction, from here to here. So it is in the minus y hat direction, g cosine alpha in the minus y hat direction. And this length, this ax vector, is g times sine alpha in the minus x hat direction. So these are my, the vectors in my problems in terms of their components using this coordinate axis. Well, this is a, just an, another motion with constant acceleration. I know the acceleration. The velocity at time t is nothing but the initial velocity plus all the incremental changes in my velocity, the acceleration time, the integral of the acceleration over time from 0 to the final time. This is my initial time, final time. Since acceleration is constant, this is just v0 plus t a. So if I, I had written the components, v0 cosine theta minus alpha, these two are just from v0. These two are just from my acceleration, using my previous expressions for the velocity and acceleration. If you look at here, I'm just calculating v0 plus a t. v0 plus a t, it just gives me the velocity at time t. Well, if I have the velocity at time t, I can calculate the position at time t. It will be just the initial position plus the incremental, the sum of incremental uh, displacement from time 0 to, from the initial time to the final time, this integral over here. And this will be well, if you just use this expression, the integral will be v0t 
plus one over t, one over two t squared times the acceleration. And if you just put everything together, this is the position of my object as a function of t. Remember, at t equal to zero, my object, I chose my origin to be the position of my object at time t equal to zero. So this is my, the formula that I have for the, the position of my object at any point, any time t. Now I'm looking for the position of this point. Sorry? No, I, I, well, since I chose my axis like this, I, I will not need to use the Pythagoras theorem. Remember, the, all the points along this line have y0 equal to 0. And the dis distance from this point O to the point P is nothing but x0 over there. I only need to calculate x0 because I already know that y0 is 0. Now, okay, I know that I throw the ball at time t equal to 0. If you put t equal to 0, this is 0, this is 0, this is 0, this is 0, everything is 0. At time t equal to 0, I'm at this origin. Now, the question is, at what time am I at this point? Well, the definition of this point is that y0 is equal to 0. That is what defines what th this point over here, p, because it is on the hill, and I have chosen my coordinate axis such that on the hill, all the points on the, on the slope have y coordinate equal to 0. So this is the x and y coordinates of any point on the trajectory. I'm looking for the point, or let's say the time, at which the y coordinate of this thing is 0. Because if the y coordinate is 0, it will be on my hill. And that's what I do. So this is my x0, this is my y0 y, y coordinate. Now here I'm saying that at t equal to t0, my particle is at this point. But if it is at this point, then the y0 coordinate should be 0. This is y0. This should be equal to 0. It has two solutions, as we expected. There is the one solution, t0 equal to 0. That is my initial time, the time that I hit the ball. And then there is also this time. This is the time it takes for my uh, mass to reach this point P. If this is the time it takes to reach my point P, then I can just calculate its x coordinate. Well, x coordinate was nothing but v0 sine theta minus alpha times t minus 1 over 2 g cosine alpha t squared. Well, this is the acceleration. Al g cosine alpha is the acceleration along the x direction. It is in the minus, sorry, uh, yeah, it's in the minus x direction, so that, that's why I have this minus sign over here. What I did is I just, I already had derived this expression of x as a function of time. I just substituted t0 over here. Well, you can go ahead and simplify this expression, but uh, that's an exercise for you, let's say. I al already have my answer. So this is the x0 coordinate, but remember, this is my core, my axis is along this line, so the OP distance is equal to my x0. So I don't need to use any Pythagoras theorem. If, well, this is one possibility. I could have chosen my coordinate axis, uh, the x-axis uh, to be horizontal, the y-axis as perpendicular. In that case, I would have obtained the x0 and the y0 points, and from the x0 and y0, using Pythagoras theorem, I, I could have calculated this hypotenuse over here. That's also a possibility, and you should get the sa exactly the same answer. Yes, I see some faces who are completely lost. Ask me. So what gets you puzzled? Yes. T0, okay. 
So do you have any uh, objection to the, f when I say that at this point, since this point is on the hill, y0 has to be 0? Any questions about that? So it's clear that at this point, y0 has to be 0. If I go back, so this is the y coordinate at time t0. So I should equate this to 0. If I equate this to 0, this is my y coordinate, y0. If I equate this to 0, I find two solutions. I, at t equal to t0 equal to 0, I'm on my hill. And at t0 is equal to this expression, I'm again on my hill. Other questions? Yes. How can I? This angle over here. Well, imagine it like this. If my x-axis was horizontal, y-axis is like this. OK? In this case, I know that my uh, gravity is also pointing in this direction. So the angle between the y-axis and my gravity is 0. My gravitational acceleration is 0. My gravitational acceleration is always, in this graph at least, is always in the vertical direction. But I'm not choosing my x-axis horizontally. I'm rotating my x-axis by alpha. But in that case, my y-axis has also rotated by alpha. So since my y-axis is rotated from the vert, it was originally it was in the vertical direction, then I rotate it by alpha degrees. So the angle between the vertical and my y-axis is now alpha. So that is that angle over there. This angle over there is the angle between the vertical. This is my vertical. This is the direction of the gravitational acceleration. And this is my rotated y-axis. Other questions? No? You are still sleeping. <laughs> now we will be switching some subjects. Well, we will be given some more definitions. We, we have two definitions before we give a break. One is the relative velocity. Up to now, I repeatedly said that the choice of the reference frame is completely arbitrary. It is up to you. But at the end of the day, what is important is, if I choose one coordinate, if I choose one coordinate axis like this, and if, what was your name? Delay. If Delay chooses some other coordinate axis, Nilay. OK, if Nilay chooses some other coordinate axis, we can study the problem, and we can find that at some time, my object is, let's say, Nilay will say that it is 5 meters along the x direction. I will say that it is 7 meters along the x direction. We will be saying different things, but if you take into account that we are using different coordinate axes, our answers will, be this will mean the same for the nature. When we interpret this nature, when we go and try to find the point where my mass is, we will both go to the same point, although we are saying that it is, she is saying that it is five meters, I'm saying that it is seven meters. We will go to the same point. So this also tells me that there should be some way of translating what she finds to what I find. Although they are different, there should be some dictionary. When she said that it's five meters, I should be able to deduce from that information that I should, I should find seven meters, not five meters. So this is basically our, this will be our dictionary if I go from one reference frame to the other reference frame. Now if my point P, Nilay measures that the, his ma her mass shifts by delta R prime. Initially it was at this point R prime, at some later time it will be let's say at this point, and she will measure R prime, another R prime, 
and the displacement is delta r prime. Meanwhile, Nilai might be moving. She is making measurements as she is walking around. So she will be moving. This is the change in the position of Nilai herself. Then I know that the displacement I should measure is the displacement that Nilai measures as she's moving around, plus the displacement that she had done herself. This, this will be, well, this is the vector, the position of my object, the position of the object according to me, according to my reference frame, this is R, is nothing but the, this, uh, the position of the object that Nilai observes plus the position of Nilai relative to my coordinate frame, my uh, coordinate axis. So this is what I observe, this is what Nilai observes, this is the difference between them. This is the position of Nilai relative to me. And we can, if this changes, the change of this can be due to either the change of this or the change of this. And in principle, it can be due to the change of both of them. So the change I observe, the displacement that I observe is the displacement that Nilai observes plus the displacement of Nilai observed in my coordinate axis. If this change happens in a, this change in position, this displacement happens in a time delta t, if I divide all of these displacements by delta t, I see that this is the velocity, well, that displacement divided by time is nothing but the velocity. That's how we define the velocity. So the velocity that I observe is nothing but the velocity that Nilai observes, this one, v is equal to v prime, plus the velocity of Nilai, the speed at which she is moving around. There is an assumption we are making here. Any ideas what we are assuming? Yes, you. Oh, the velocities, okay. So this is the relation between the positions in different coordinate frames. And, and so this is the relation between the displacements observed by different observers in different coordinate, in different, using different coordinate axes. I just divided by the time it takes for the object to move from this point to this point, let's say. I will be observing a displacement delta r. Nilai will be observing a displacement delta r prime. And she will be moving around by this much. In a time, delta t. I just divide the displace both sides of this equation by delta t. That is what I did. But this is. The displacement of my object in my core using my coordinate axis, this delta r, delta t is the time it takes for this displacement. So this is the velocity that I observe, delta r over delta t. Now this delta r prime was the displacement of the object, the same displacement, but just expressed in the coordinate axis used by Nilay. So this is the displacement in time delta t. So this is the velocity that Nilai observes. Remember, the velocity is always the displacement divided by the time. So this is the displacement. This is the time. So this is the velocity of the object according to Nilai. It might be that I observe a velocity 5 meters per second in this direction. Nilai observes the velocity with 3 meters per second in this direction, in the same direction. It just tells me that Nilai is mo also moving. And this is the velocity of Nilai in my reference frame. You can just imagine it also like this. What is the velocity? It is the displacement in a given time. So Nilai just measures an object. She's, she sees that in a given time, that object, with respect to her, has been displaced by three meters in the x direction. I look at Nilai. And I see that in the same time, 
Nilai has moved two meters. The object has uh, got away from Nilai by three meters, but Nilai has moved by two meters. So the object has moved by five meters, in, according to me. I didn't understand. So how would I need to modify my equations if the space is self-moving? He's saying, if I understood it correctly, he's saying that, what was your name? Pelin. So Nilai is, I, I look at Nilai and see that Nilai is moving at some velocity. Nilai observes some other object. But then Pelin tells me that I'm also mov moving with some velocity. So is that what you're saying? No. Well, you see, this velocity is the velocity of the object with respect to Nilai. This velocity is the velocity of the same object with respect to me. And this capital V is the velocity of Nilai relative to me. Well, simple questions usually are har the hardest to answer because it's quite hard to realize that there's really a question there. Any other ideas? Um, everything here seems quite obvious, right? Um, it doesn't look like we are making any assumptions. But let's see. This delta R prime, or let's say R prime, Let's think of what this R prime is. How do we obtain that R prime? Because in physics, everything, ha every physical quantity has to be measurable. If we are claiming that the position of an object is physical, we have to be able to measure it. That is what, make, what gives sense to it. So Nilai makes a measurement. This is the object at, at uh, this is my object. Nilai measures its distance along the x-axis, finds such a distance, and then she measures the same point along the y-axis and measure this distance. Th and then she concludes that this is the vector r. So she makes measurements. Then I make measurement. This r is what I obtain. I measure this point. Let's just concentrate on the x component only. I measure the x component of this thing. I measure the x component of the position of Nilay in my coordinate axis, using my coordinate axis, and I say that, okay, the position of P of my object at a given time, the X component of the position, is nothing but the X component of Nilai relative to me, measured by me, plus the X component of the position of this event relative to Nilai, measured by Nilai. I am assuming that the measurement made by Nilai should be the same as the measurement made by me. That's an assumption I'm making. I'm saying that if I would go and make that measurement, I would find the same number as Nilay did. That's an assumption. Is it true? It might be true. I mean, assumption doesn't mean that it's false. But it's an assumption at the end of the day. Do you think it is true? If I'm asking it, it's probably wrong. Now, well, this, is, this is what we call the Galilean relativity. We assume that all measurements agree in whichever reference frame we are, we are, in whichever coordinates we are talking about. But just relaxing this assumption led Einstein to the discovery of special theory of relativity. That is what special theory of relativity tells us. The measurement of length between different coordinate axes do not necessarily agree. They are not equal. They are not necessarily equal. They can change. But since we are currently we are not studying special theory of relativity, we will continue with this assumption that the measurement made by Nilay, and if I would go and make the same measurement, that is the distance between this O prime and this point P, we, are, we will going to assume that they are the same. And it's a good as approximation, as long as we are not moving at very high velocities. But that is just something to keep in mind.
questions? Yes. We are the origins, but we are carrying our coordinate axes with ourselves. So you can just imagine that I'm moving around like this, and Nilay is from there, she's moving around like this with the co coordinate axis. It's there we are both the origins and the coordinate axis. Uh, you have probably heard that Einstein was fired from school because of asking stupid questions. So that's why you should ask stupid questions. Usually the revolutions come from stupid questions. Any other questions about this relative velocity? One thing that quite often gets confused is what to add to which vector. So is it V equal to V prime plus capital V or V prime is equal to small v pl plus capital V? If you get such a confusion, always imagine, you can always imagine in terms of distances. So if Nilay is moving relative, if Nilay has moved by three meters in one second, if another object has moved by five meters according to Nilay in one second, the total uh, displacement of my object according to me will be just eight meters per second. So that will tell you which vector to add to which other vector. Sure. The zero prime, okay. You are saying V plus V prime is equal to capital V? No? Well, this is the... Well, okay, yes, V minus V prime is equal to capital V. It's the same equation. Well, here's an example from your book. So. You can experiment with this quite soon, probably. It will start raining in Ankara. And so we have, imagine you are going, well, in this example, it's a train, but imagine you are going in the bus or minibuses in Dolmish. And you look at outside, it's raining. You assume that if you would be standing on Earth, the raindrops are vertical. So it's just raining vertically, there's no wind. But when you look outside, you will see that the raindrops, they make a tilted angle on the window. They, they will go at an angle. Now the question is, if the speed of the bus is Vt, do you see the mistake here? There's a mistake in that sentence. Yeah, this is the velocity of the train, not the speed. Remember, speed is a number. It is just the magnitude of this vector. Okay, if the velocity of the train is Vt, what is the speed of the raindrops in the reference frame of the Earth in which they are assumed to fall vertically? So you make the measurement. You know the, the speed of your car. You, see, you measure the angle that the raindrops make. So assuming that in the Earth reference frame they are vertical, you measure the angle, you know the angle theta, you know the speed, Given this information, what is the velocity of the raindrops? Well, this will be, by the way, your homework today, uh, the, in the first homework after the first rain, after today. Just measure what's the velocity of the raindrops in Ankara. Yeah, you always want to use the Pythagoras theorem with everything, right? <laughs> Well, we will be using Pythagoras theorem. No. So let's just draw it and understand what's going on. We have the velocity of the rain. This is in the rest. Well, this is the coordinate axis. This is my coordinate axis. I'm in the car, moving, looking out. 
I know that in the reference frame of the Earth, this is what the, raindrop, the velocity of the raindrops are. They are vertical in the minus z direction. They are falling down. And the Earth, if I'm moving in that direction, in the positive x direction, the Earth is moving relative to me in the negative x direction. And let us denote it by this velocity. It is, well, if I'm moving with 60 kilometers per hour, in the, rest for, in the f uh, coordinate axis which I'm at rest, the Earth will be moving 60 kilometers per hour in the opposite direction. So the velocity of the Earth is nothing but minus the velocity of the car. Uh, it is in this direction. So if I just look outside, the raindrops, if they fall by two meters in the Earth frame, the Earth has moved by, let's say, one meter in the negative x direction. In total, the Earth's thrust will have me move just two meters down, one meters left. So this is the, the raindrops in the reference frame of the car. This is the direction of the velocity of the raindrops. Well, we see that the velocity makes an angle theta. And now we can use the, well, if you want, we can use the Pythagoras theorem saying that, well, the problem with the Pythagoras theorem is that you can say, okay, you don't really know this velocity. You only know theta and you know the velocity of Earth. That is the velocity of your car. Those are the informations you have. So from these two information, you have to derive this VR, the velocity of the raindrops in the rest frame of Earth. Well, if you just look tangent theta, it is nothing but, well, the si length of this is nothing but the speed corresponding to this velocity. It is the speed of Earth. And divided by the length of this, the length of that is nothing but the speed of the raindrops. So tangent theta is the speed of Earth divided by the speed of raindrops. Speed of Earth is nothing but the speed of the car. So the velocity of the raindrops is just the velocity of the train or the car divided by tangent theta. Well, one over the tangent theta is cotangent theta. So if you know the, you know the speed of the car, you just read it from the speedometer of the car. And you know, you can measure the angle, theta. With these two information, you can calculate the speed of the raindrops in the rest frame of the Earth. So this is something that you should do at the first rainfall. Any questions? Yes. Well, I'm in, my, in the car. I look outside. I see that the Earth is moving backwards. So that is, the Earth is moving backwards, so that is the speed of the Earth in the coordinate axis that is moving with me. True. The velocity speed of Earth is equal to the speed of car. The velocity of Earth is minus the velocity of train because they are moving in opposite directions. And also remember one thing. There is something wrong writing expressions like this. We will always be writing them down, understanding that we should always keep in mind that this velocity, velocity of the car, is measured with a coordinate axis at rest on Earth, Vt. This is the velocity of my train. Whereas the velocity of Earth, this is the velocity of Earth measured using a coordinate axis at rest inside the car. So these two velocities are measured in different coordinate systems. So they cannot really be, they are not really related. But just numerically, we have the VE is equal to minus VT. Other questions?
Yes. Well, it's like apples and oranges. I can both say that I have three of them. This is what I am saying. But three apples is not equal to three oranges. Because both these two vectors are measured using different coordinate axes. In a sense, one is an apple, the other one is an orange. Yeah. We will always make use of such notation. It's just to keep in mind that although we are saying that they are equal, they are objects that are measured in different coordinate axes, using different coordinate axes. Within the assumptions that we make, that we are moving at small velocities, we are not reaching the speed of light, this, will be, this is valid. But if you go to the speed of light, the, even this equality numerically, it will be wrong. But that is beyond our subject. Yes. It is at rest. Sure. I mean, I am always at rest in my coordinate system, in the coordinate system that is moving with me. Just like the train will be at rest if you measure its velocity with respect to a coordinate system that is moving with the train. <laughs> 